the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and the Built Environment, Professor Saurabh Sina, who's shortly also going to be our new Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Research and Internationalization, a position which he takes, assumes on the 1st of December. Professor Peter Olabambi, our inductee for this evening. Professor Leslie Cornish, from Professor from Wits University, and our respondent for the evening. Very pleased to have you with us, ma'am, this evening. Members of Senate and other academics, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Sanbanani, Kuyanan, good evening, and Tabela. It's indeed a great honor and special privilege for me to welcome you to the professorial inauguration of Professor Peter Alabambi. As I do so, I wish to express a warm word of welcome to your loved ones, sir. I believe they're in the audience this evening, to your special guests, and to all of your colleagues here this evening. It's indeed a proud and joyful moment, yet a landmark moment for all of you, for Prof. Alabambi, and of course for all of us here at UJ and higher education in South Africa and beyond. A professorial inauguration such as the one we will be participating in today is a truly significant occasion in the life of a university. It represents the formal induction of a senior member of faculty into the ranks of the academic professoriate. Inaugurations often regarded as pompous and ceremonial as we wear our gowns and we have this little ritual um, but they tend to be very dignified, I hope, well-meaning and unsullied. The professorial inauguration also dates back to ancient Rome as the opportunity for the formal investiture of a person into high office and it marks the formal assumption of office or position of authority. The original Roman meet meaning of the noun professor is to confess before the public. The term professor in the late Middle Ages was used to refer to university teachers of the highest order. While the act was no longer a confession, but rather a declaration and an exposition of one's academic discipline, the very public nature of the event remains entrenched even up to today. It is and has always been the opportunity for an eminent scholar to explain the principles, procedures, and objects of one's scholarly gaze to one's peers, members of the public, and to one's family. The act of professing was a prelude to the conferring of the title of professor, a title that's conferred upon very few and requires that one is famous for one's work acknowledged amongst the universities of Europe as being preeminent in one's particular field of inquiry. This elite group comprised the Senate as it is and remains today. In addition, however, there's more to the history of the professor and the inauguration. Professors frequently hold chairs in their disciplines. The medieval origin of the chair derives from Islam. The caliph himself would appoint a kursi or a chair in a university or madrasa. The appointment was normally for life and the chairholder would literally sit in a chair surrounded by students. The kursi, like the professor, was highly esteemed and for good reasons. Perhaps the most shining example of Islamic learning in Africa was the establishment of the University of Timbuktu in Mali in the 12th century. Nine centuries ago, this seat of learning had 25,000 students from Africa and the Mediterranean. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, from two distinct medieval university traditions, one steeped in Islam, the other in Christianity, an outstanding academic elite was established. The situation is no different today. 
As a leading institution of higher education, the University of Johannesburg goes to great lengths to make professorial appointments that will ensure that the status and quality of the university is maintained for the next generation. Our professors are truly significant members of our university. As members of Senate, they guide our decision-making around core academic functions. They represent their disciplines both within and outside of the university, in academic contexts and in broader professional and social contexts. They offer academic leadership. They're responsible for nurturing young faculty and supporting them as they mature into the next generation of scholars. And they ensure that we offer our students a quality learning experience. All of this, of course, requires qualities in addition to the erudition which we primarily associate with being a professor. It requires professors and academic teachers who show a human face, who combine academic leadership with concern and care for their colleagues and students. And so today is a day that marks the rites of passage and the formal investiture of Professor Alambambi into the distinguished community of the university's most senior scholars. This evening, we will have one small insight into how Professor Alabambi responds to the call for professor, professorial leadership of the highest order. Professor Alabambi, I certainly look forward to your inaugural lecture, and I must admit the title of your address, and I quote, Materials in Dilemma, has already intrigued me, and I look forward to hearing more on this very intriguing topic. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. I now call upon the Executive Dean to introduce Professor Alamalbe. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to introduce Peter Apata Olubambi. Peter Apata Olubambi was born in Akunu, Akunu Okoko, Nigeria. He obtained his bachelor's with honors and master's degrees in metallurgical and materials engineering from the Federal University of Technology in Akure in Nigeria in 1998 and 2002 respectively and a doctorate in metallurgical engineering from the University of Witwatersrand in 2008. After the award of his bachelor's degree and successful completion of, a, of the Nigerian one-year compulsory National Youth Service Scheme, he was appointed as a graduate assistant at the Federal University of Technology, Akuru, Akuru in March 2000. So, uh, prior to his appointment as a, full prof as a professor at the University of Johannesburg in October 2015, he also worked at the Tswane University of Technology as a senior lecturer. His research uh, activities spanned between two broad research fields of extractive metallurgy and advanced materials and metamorphosed from the former to the latter. He started his research activities in the field of mineral processing and hydrometallurgy and later changed to advanced and nano-engineered material processing. The transformation took place immediately after the completion of his PhD degree in 2008 when he was also he, when he was appointed as a postdoctoral fellow for seven months to work as a research consultant on the Wits University Element 6 Thermal Spray Company project that involved the development of improved techniques for synthesizing nanostructured polycrystalline diamond and nanocrystalline hard metals coatings. His current research activities are focused on the three key international fields of advanced materials, nano-engineered metallic alloys and composites, nanomechanics, and and tri tribal corrosion. And so you can see why materials are in a dilemma. <laughs> he is involved in the utilization of innovative powder metallurgical technique for developing high strength, high temperature, and tribal corrosion resistance, submicron, and nanostructured advanced metallic alloys 
and metal ceramics com composites for the extreme in, for extreme environments in the aerospace mines chemical and allied industries as well as for biomedical applications professor olubambi is a vibrant scholar with excellent leadership skills and an involvement in the service to many science and engineering communities he is a professional metallurgical engineer registered with the council of regulation engineering in nigeria or corin as a member of the international network on tribal corrosion he drives tribal corrosion research in africa he is an editorial board member of the international journal of bio and tribal corrosion which is a springer journal and the managing editor of the african corrosion journal an official publication of the corrosion institute of south africa he is uh, very involved with the institute in the capacity of the tech of, of being the technical convener of the bi biannual african corrosion congress africo 2014 6 2016 and also the upcoming 2018 event he has collaborated and still collaborating with researchers from many south african universities and research institutes and institutions in nigeria Ghana, Argentina, France, Germany, and USA. Through the funds that he attracted from the DST NRF and some industrial analytical services, he established a high-tech powder metallurgy research lab, which was worth over 30,000 rands, and the Institute of Nanoengineering Research, which was established at Swana University of Technology. I want to say that he actually attracted that amount of funding while he was there and I know this because I met him through his, some of his grant applications uh, that were submitted to the NRF at the time. Uh, within, the f within the past two years of appointment at the university, he, was at, he has attracted already 15 million rand from the DST NRF for the setting up of the Laboratory of Nanomechanics and Tribal Corrosion Research, whose, char whose charter is under consideration and approval as a research center. This research center is based at our Durenfontein campus. He also received 4.8 million this year under the DST NRF priority research area and the collaborative postgraduate training grant as scholarships for about 40 masters and 12 doctoral students. Uh, and that is just, f just this year. When he, uh, when he first mentioned it to me, I thought it is a multi-year. Uh, uh, he is an NRF rated established researcher and a professor in the field of materials engineering. He has graduated 17 masters and eight doctoral students and mentored four postdoctoral research fellows of whom uh, 14 are currently in academic positions as lecturers and senior lecturers in South Africa and also abroad. He is currently supervising 16 doctoral and 28 master's students uh, and mentoring five postdoctoral research fellows. And if the numbers were not adding up, that's also because some of his grants are, are, super, are supervised by other academics who he also mentors in the department. Uh, he has published about 90 articles in reputable international journals and a number of uh, conference proceedings. Having had over 17 years university teaching research experiences with strong commitments for research excellence, graduate training and development, knowledge transfer, and also through his uh, skills in handling industrial R&D, he has developed enormous passions for skills training, capacity building, and industrial consulting. By the way, he's also an expert of writing to the dean at any time and when you think it is automated, you write back to him and he responds. <laughs> so, so he is in the fourth industrial revolution, I don't know, but uh, he is rather responsive at just about any time of the day and night. Um, and with strong entrepreneurial passion, he envisaged within the next five years the industrialization of his uh, research lab to near net shape fabrication of intricate components with controlled micro nanocrystalline structures providing improved product quality and increased design freedom for the aerospace and automotive industry. So that's his introduction. <laughs> Don't worry, I did tell him that this is before and there will be an after. <laughs> I think you're next here. Good evening. 
all protocols duly observed. Um, I've been appropriately introduced, and the topic is here before us. Um, one of my boss, um, we used to say, the message is greater than the messenger. I'll, I'll try to see how I will be able to convey the message so that we can really understand exactly the type of dilemma that materials are facing. Um, the presentation overview is as shown above. Um, by the time I get to material service performance dilemma, we begin, we begin to understand what exactly we are, are talking about. Um, when the, the deputy vice chancellor was talking, he was talking about professor, uh, I mean, professorship from the biblical and from the Islamic viewpoint. There has been generally um, a kind of um, a disagreement um, between the religious group, the atheists, and the scientists about creation. We, I mean, up to now, um, the Christians believe that God created man. Um, scientists believe that man um, evolved from Abe. And atheists, I, I, I really don't know their belief because I'm, I'm not an atheist, but I'm a scientist, I'm a, and I'm a Christian. But there is there's a general agreement in which there is no, which there no dispute, either scientifically or um, biblically. I mean, it was recorded that it was one man that started. We, we have not seen that probably there are several millions of men, human beings that, that evolved from I mean, um, animals. So ever since man has been existing, there have been the, this struggle for, I mean, for his need, comfort, food, and materials have been observed as the pillar for technological growth. Um, man started looking for food, and man saw stone and began to make fire from stone. Luckily enough, my other brother is here, I, mean, I made fire, we made fire from stone before, so man made fire from stone. Man began to use stone, shaped stone, to kill animals for food. And when man began to increase upon the face of the earth, man began to use the same stone to, I mean, to fight I mean, as weapons. Later, man observed that there are some kind of, um, there are some kind of stones that are malleable that you can shape. And those were copper-based based material, and that age was called the Bronze Age, in which um, man began to see, especially women, they want to deck themselves with very good ornament, they want to look nice, so man began to shape copper as ornaments. Um, when there are kings, um, they want to have very nice, fanciful decoration, they began to use uh, bronze. Then man began to use um, form it I mean, as kind of I mean, weapon, to kill animals and to kill themselves. <laughs> Later, <laughs> I mean, as man begin to grow, I mean, as man begin to increase upon the face of the earth, there's need for us, for man, to build bridges, to build houses, to I mean, so now the age of iron came, which we just call I mean, iron age, and from iron age, iron age led to the first industrial revolution in which I mean, I mean man began to see um, the need for mass production, the need for division of labor because I mean man began to increase, begin to build cars, I mean so many industries. Then later the age of information to this person age we are talking about um, fourth industrial revolution, which is based on information technology. Now, how to do with materials? Different materials, no matter how, I mean, I mean we look for a material with a, a very high processing, I mean, I mean, I mean I, a kind of a high processing um, capability, and material that, that can also, I mean, also be able to maintain heat transfer. 
No. Um, if you look at it very, very well, in the first and second industrial revolution, man's interest was on bulk materials, high strength, corrosion resistant material. Within the third and the fourth industrial revolution, man began to talk about nanostructured composites, talk about um, smart materials, um, talk about um, shape memory, um, talk about electronics material. So in any technological development, in any industrial revolution, materials have been, got, no matter how the technology is, you need material to be able to sustain it. Um, when man first started, I mean, in those years, Stone Age, um, Bronze Age, there were lifted materials, and the method to produce materials were very um, crude. But with the improving technology based on the need of men, man understood that um, metals and ceramic can be brought together to form composites. Then man, be, man understood that if you are able to control the structure of the material, you can be able to control the property of the material. Now, man began to see, okay, how do I come up with the best technology to obtain the materials of the desired property? Nevertheless, we all have to agree that environment is becoming more complex. Um, those days, there were no carbon emission. When there's carbon emission and there's rain, it forms a kind of carbonic acid. It begins to form corrosion. Environment begins to, I mean, environment begins to get harsh. I mean, I will go further. Um, as the operational complexities and the dynamic service conditions requirements of the current and the emerging and the future technologies um, continues, uh, materials, I mean, the components that are needed for this technology, I mean, faces a very huge challenge. And it requires the development of improved materials to be able to sustain the technologies. Um, permit me to just pause a bit and go to um, what really motivated me and how I mean, have my research progressed. Um, I started my research, I mean, um, activity in year 2000 when I was uh, appointed, I mean, as a graduate assistant. Um, I was teaching, I was assigned to teach, I was also doing research, I was doing my PA, I mean, I was doing my master's. Between 2000 and 2009, I was focused basically on mineral processing and extractive methodology. Towards the end of 2007, 2008, I began to work in the area of materials corrosion. But in, I mean, after I, mean, I obtained my PhD, I found out that, that look, um, with the seven years, um, seven months I spent at LMNC, I'm going to appreciate LMNC specifically. I, um, I started working on the area of smart coatings, I mean, hard materials and duplex stainless steels. Um, basically, I was us using hot press and surface engineering technology. Later, um, when I began to push through the NRF, I got grant. I now moved to, re to the era of um, thermal management materials for microelectronics and shape memory materials. We, were, we began to use um, spark plasma sintering. In 2014, um, when we got um, um, a very big grant, we bought the hybrid sintering. Then I began to use the hybrid technology. And, and I'm about to say, okay, then it was actually my first dilemma. Now that I have, um, now that we have a kind of, of a part of, I mean, part of ontology lab, what do I need to do? Let me come, come back to where I can make impact. And luckily enough, I had a chat with the National Aerospace Center. I was motivated a lot and I started working on light materials using hybrid sintering. Um, initially, I was working on conventional materials up till 2013. 
Later, I mean, by 2013, I began to work in the area of nanostructured materials. Um, basically, today, I, I will be presenting um, my work in the area of what I have done between the year 2009 and 2014 and now. The catch is that I'm, I was in dilemma to see which area should actually present on. And I thought, okay, let me present on the hot area, the area that I'm actually launching into, the area in which we have been able to publish a few papers. And I'll be talking on the um, thermo mechano chemical dilemma when you're trying to produce these nanostructured materials and some of the, um, some of the, um, I mean, the dynamic conditions in which the materials, I mean, are subjected to. Permit me to go back again to my, um, to my history. Um, there is a, a lot of debate, and I don't think that it is something that can be, um, I mean, apart from the religious people, but basic, using science with the religious, we will all believe that human race started in Africa. And Africa begins from, from Africa to Asia, from Asia to, to North America, and stuff like that. Now, you know, um, some of my I mean, students just returned from America today, and they left just about how many hours ago? Just about 15 hours ago. And you see mass mobilization of people. Uh, people begin to look for money and for comfort from South Africa. You go to UK, from UK, you go to US, from US, you go to Asia. People are just moving all around. Now, we need to move around. What do we need to you move? There comes the concept that Airbus actually came with, um, with the largest passenger, um, passenger aircraft, which can almost about um, eight, I mean, 868 passengers. And people began to say, okay, even this world that we are, we have not even exploited enough. We have not even I mean, made I mean, comfort of, of it enough. People began, began to go to space. And the, te the temperature there is extremely high, above 3,000 degrees. Man begin to look for material that can be used in those, in those areas. Little after Airbus developed the Airbus 380, within the space of three, four years, it was observed that the plane began to have some cracks. Now, there's a dilemma because Airbus were trying to see how do I um, reduce fuel, how do I conserve and be able to save cost, try to develop lightweight, lightweight material so that the cost of fuel can be reduced. Um, in, in trying to trade off cost, material began to fail. And actually, um, Airbus spent billions I mean, of dollars to be able to provide some solution. Despite the fact, just at the beginning of this month, we observed there was a plane that was going to, um, going to California and, and the engine failed. Because now there's a dilemma. You wanted to see, I mean, how can I ensure that I have a material that's lightweight to save money? But at the end of the day, I mean, there's health, I mean, I mean risk there. Now, that's one of the things that made us to understand what can we do, try to motivate the work that, work that we are doing. Um, you know, um, I was talking about how man begin to move. Let's look at this. A typical, I mean, as an old person, even younger people, we begin to see, I mean, arthritis. By the time you begin to move and your weight is very high, I mean, I mean, probably if your weight is a bit higher, I mean, <laughs> we're going to see that, I mean, there is a kind of a mechanical force upon, upon your bones. Then it begins to affect, affect your bones. Now, people have been trying to see how to develop, okay, different type of material that can be used so that the bone, I mean, is cut off and you use a kind of um, um, a biomedical implant to, I mean, to, to I mean, to replace, I mean, to replace your bone. I mean, apart from that, 
apart from that, there are other areas, especially any part of your body that there's a mechanical action. Let's take, for instance, um, a child that is born, um, there's a young baby, I mean, young baby here. Um, if you see the teeth, the teeth is very white. By the time the child, by the time you get up to 30, 40, the teeth begin to brown. Because of what? Because of corrosion or saliva and, and wear action, where they are, I mean, begin to eat bones and, and, and everything. So it's called a kind of, uh, a kind of uh, corrosion and wear. So uh, I have one of my friends that I'm collaborating with, two of them. One is America, one is in France. The one in France smokes. The one in America is a pastor. Because, <laughs> because just trying to discredit the one in France, and I actually have two of my students there now working. I mean, he started working on the tribal corrosion effect of smoking on your teeth. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's that, that, that. Let's leave biomedical. Let's go to the mining or the process industries. Um, okay. In, in Ghana, when gold was discovered, black man saw it as black, black stone, the street away. Most times we begin to blame, blame Europe, blame Amer uh, I mean America. We don't want to blame ourselves. A black man saw nice gold threw it away. I mean, an American came there, a white man came, oh, this is nice. He picked it and refined it and began to sell it, back, sell it back to us. Now, those days, we could see high-grade us. These days, high-grade us are no longer there. Uh, I was in um, Kusasa Little Mine. I was not able to go inside, but one of my students, is a manager there, told me that it is almost 13 kilometers down down the head cross. What is the man doing there? Because high grade us are no longer there, and low grade us are there. So now, by the time you want to drill it, man develop a kind of, I mean, a hard metal to drill rocks. But because of the force, mechanical action, and the fluid there, before you see it, begin to see that it has rusted, it has degraded. Likewise, this is steel, steel pipe, I mean, and a steel pump. Um, as they begin to transport and pump, um, mining, um, mining uh, I mean, process water, you see it, it has degraded. So now, one now find out what is, so the action, the process by which these materials degrade either the human system or the one that used to drill rocks is called tribal corrosion, in which there is wear taking place, there is corrosion taking place. And at the same time, wear degrades, corrosion degrades, and the material is there. So it's a dilemmatic situation. If you choose corrosion, it, it's a problem. If you choose wear, it's a problem. And, and the fact is that you cannot choose one. You have to be able to adapt yourself onto that condition. So tribal corrosion is just a kind of, I mean, if I'm to defi define it, is materials degradation resulting from the interplay of chemical, electrochemical, and mechanical processes. And sometimes corrosion can, um, I mean, where can enhance corrosion? Because corrosion, especially for a passivating material, it forms a kind of a passivating layer. But when, when we are, I mean, when there is friction, the passivating layer breaks off. Now, the, the new surface is exposed. So when there is um, corrosion and we are not comes in, it enhances degradation. Another aspect is that corrosion can also enhance wear. Especially if one of the faces is selectively dissolved, then um, friction can easily remove and the material, I mean, is degraded. However, sorry, um, corrosion can, some, can sometimes inhibit wear, especially if the film that is formed is passive and it is pseudoplastic 
initial. And based on this, um, based on this condition, we came up the, with the concept that okay, there are some material that are pseudo, that are pseudoplastic, that are also hard. I, mean, I will tell us when I get there. Okay, I want to talk about what actually motivated me to uh, nano engineered materials processing. Um, we all know the knowledge of materials and um, what you call it nanoscience is well known. Um, how to make nanoparticles. People have known it. The knowledge of advanced materials processing, uh, alloying, all those things, it is well known. But there is a, a gap. How do you make a nano, I mean, a bulk materials in which the internal structures or the faces are nanocrystalline in nature? That is called nanoengineering. And that is the focus of that what's up. Let's try to bridge this gap. Try to talk about fabrication of components with I mean and devices with nanocrystalline structure. I mean, let's take a typical example. Okay. This is um, a turbine blade. Now, within I mean, the internal structure of the turbine blade is made of nanograins, in which the grains are very, very tiny, tiny, tiny particles. Let me explain why that tiny nanogreen. From the um, materials engineering and from the I mean, Holpage and Griffiths relation, we've, we found out, okay, like now, I mean, if the grain size is decreased, the grain battery increases. The smaller the grain size, the larger the grain boundaries, I mean, the surface area for for the scientists, the surface area, surface area in, in increase. Now, when the surface area increase, the engineering properties of the material is increased. Let's look at what, okay. Let's look at typical relation. As, I mean, as the grain size decrease, meaning that I mean, as the material be becomes micro, mm, uh, Submicron or nano size, although um, whole pairs has a kind of a limitation, we observe that the strength of the material is increased. This relation is actually explained by Griffith's equation talking about the compressive strength. So, this is the grain size. When the grain size is decreased, the strength is increased. Whole pairs also looked at it critically. When the grain size is decreased, the yield strength increases. And the higher the yield strength of a material, the, the stronger the material is. Now, the higher, I mean, the smaller the grain size, the higher the hardness of the material. So, taking up this concept, oh, Seiko is good. Now, let's all try to see how do we come to the knowledge of making a very big component in which the structure are nanocrystalline in nature. Um, people have been talking about, um, there are different types of metamethyl composite. There's particulate and there's fi fiber reinforced. For the particulate, particulate system has a limitation of the fact that they are very brittle. So if you want to use it for a, a kind of, um, of a turbine blade and you are using a kind of a particulate reinforcement, you might end up getting a brittle material, even though the, mm, I mean, the hardness might be increased. So there's not the, the need to move towards fiber reinforcement in which the reinforcement are like fibers. And those fibers can carry the load and they can also pin, I mean, pinning down green boundary, I mean, what call it? I mean, um, pinning down these locations. So, and in trying to pin down the dislocation, the strength of the materials is increased. There come the concept of carbon nanotubes. Carbon nanotubes, they are, they are tubes. They are just like the hair, but very, very, I mean, the sizes are very, very, sm I mean, smaller, like a tube. So now, by time, I mean, the ability to be able to um, incorporate carbon nanotubes as fiber 
into the metallic um, matrix can drastic, will drastically improve both the hardness and the strength of the material. Now, let me go to the motivation for the, um, the type of work, the type of material that we worked upon. We know from, um, from um, uh, electronics, when computers started, they were using a very big, very big room for I mean, that first generation computer. Now, we are in the fourth industrial revolution now in which you can just use your phone now and everything. As we are here now, you are talking to people in, in US and everywhere. There is a problem. A problem there is that, I mean, within, within the, your microelectronics, a lot of heat is generated. There is a need for a material, a thermal management material, that can be able to conduct heat without expansion. That's where we now talk of, okay, carbon nanotubes has a very high conductivity and low coefficient of thermal expansion. If we are able to put, if we are able to infuse carbon nanotubes, we'll be able to develop a material that can be able to reduce the coefficient, the coefficient of thermal expansion. The second motivation for the work that we have done is, uh, you know, I was talking about um, the issue with Airbus, you see, I mean, as an example. Now, um, the, the heaviest part of an aircraft is the aero engine. And aero engine is made up of, um, the first, uh, I mean, the, the turbine blade is made up of titanium C4, then as it progresses further, also titanium, I mean, under alloy of titanium, as it, um, as it progresses further, also under alloy of titanium. Later, um, super alloys, I mean, in which uh, the temperature zone is between 1,200 to 730. Towards the end is 730 degrees, and um, titanium aluminite is mostly used there. So we wanted to see, okay, how can we make this, um, this aero engine lighter? And how can we produce a material that is high strength, that is not, because, you know, I've told you that if we work on particulate, um, it will be brittle. So the idea of carbon nanotubes also come upon, okay? because carbon nanotubes, they are very strong and they are very light. So that one motivated us to see how do we work. So we'll be working in the area of titanium C4 with carbon nanotubes. Um, we've been working in the area of titanium, aluminite with carbon nanotubes, and we've been, we just started some work in the area of nickel, aluminite with carbon nanotubes, because nickel aluminite has been seen as a better, let, let's say, a comparative alternative. Now, we wanted to see how do we make the structure to, so that the carbon nanotubes are well aligned within within the metal, that remains a big challenge. And that is what most researchers that are working in the same field have been battling with. So we found out that, let's all try to see, let's all use carbon nanotubes, I'm sorry, let's all use powder metallurgy technique. And powder metallurgy is just, um, is um, fabrication of component from metallic or ceramic powders I mean, as a source. What we did was that we had our carbon nanotubes and our metals. We mixed them together using either um, milling or using mixing or tubular, tubular mixing. Then later, we went to spark plasma sintering. And spark plasma sintering is an enhanced, is the latest technology, I mean, in powder metallurgy. And powder, I mean, spark plasma sintering, what does it do? The material is heated far above, um, just a bit below the metal temperature. Because if we use the conventional hot press, as you press for a long time, 
the grain begin, I mean, there's necking, and the grain begin to become bigger. So the purpose of nano engine, I mean, of trying to make nano structure is defeated. So we use the spark plasma sintering system. What does it do is that it is heated, very red hot, and there is a kind of an electric current that passes through, through, the, through the powder and also through, through the dye. So it is heated both from top and from the side. And the method of heating is called, I mean, the first aspect of it is where sparkna, I mean, plasma is, I mean, is generated when the, when the powders are nearly touching one another a plasma is generated. And when the powder has touched each other, there's a dual heating. So both type of heating took place. And within five minutes, it is compressed. So, and it can, not that it can, it definitely um, inhibit green growth. So you can get your material with nanocrystalline. And for now, these are the type of samples that we've been producing because it is still at the experimental stage. What we have been able to do, we'll be working, um, there are different type of material we've been working on, but I'll be talking more on biomaterials and CNT with um, copper and with, um, with titanium. Let me know this time. Okay, so, in trying to develop these materials, there's a dilemma. You know, I've talked about the dilemma of materials in service. Now, the dilemma of materials, how do you now produce the material that you can actually use, that can, that can function effectively? One, our focus is to have a material like this. But to disperse carbon nanotubes inside metal, to have this is a problem. There are three problems. Problem, problem, uh, problem one is that carbon nanotube itself, there is I mean, an attractive force between them. So as you try to mix it, it doesn't go. It continues to agglomerate. Um, metal powder itself, by the time you are trying to mill it, it um, there's a kind of a welding. It welded together. So now, there will be um, a segregation between carbon nanotubes and metals. Now, if you now want to bring the two of them together, because, of, because carbon nanotubes want to be together, metal powders that are supposed to uh, either carbon nanotubes come inside the metallic powders, or the metallic powders go inside the carbon nanotubes, they themselves, they weld it together. Now, there is division. So, we now come with strategies. There are different strategies that can be used. Either to use a kind of a solution, or to use a kind of a mechanical milling, or high energy ball milling. But try to look at it. If we do it, what can we get? Like I said, if we mill at a very high speed, at the end of the day, your carbon nanotube is broken down. So it may not be able to carry load. If you don't mill it um, fast enough, probably at a very slow, slow milling speed, you have segregation. So now, I mean, how do you balance it? Then when you are actually going into sintering also, even when you're trying to mill it, there's the possibility for metal to react with carbon and form metacarbide. And when metacarbide is formed, the structure of the carbon nanotube is destroyed. So, meaning that now, what we want to get, we may not get it. Uh, the, the other thing is that during sintering, if care is not taken, there might be carbide formation. And when carbide is formed, carbide can actually be good, be at the, at the same time, carbide might also have a kind of a detrimental effect. When carbide is formed, it's, it's hardening the material, material become more hardened, and the hardness is increased. But you have already jeopardized because um, the metals have already reacted with your carbon nanotubes. 
So the purpose of adding carbon to is defeated. You know, try to see. I mean, how can I? I mean, which uh, which of them do I trade? I mean, trade off. Sometimes carbon. I mean, if you form some traces of uh, of metal carbide, is is of importance. So um, we now came up with the, the idea. Let us use multi-wall carbon nanotubes so that even if the first wall re reacted with metal and formed metal carbides, the remaining um, walls within can carry the load and can strengthen the material. If you look at another issue, another problem is that the interface between CNT and metals, sometimes the interface might not be, I mean, might not be strong enough because of the difference in the, um, let's say, the melting point of carbon and metals. Carbon has a very high melting point, over almost 300. Now, a metal is melting point is just around 1,000, or some even 300, some 1,600. So now, how, I mean, how do you now ensure that you get a very good, very good um, green boundary? So these are some of the dilemmas that we observe. This is an area that is rich in carbon nanotube. This area is an area that is just purely um, titanium based with some small patches of metal carbides. If you look at it now, this one, we have a kind of a retained carbon nanotubes. Now, the, the, the mechanical properties of region A is going to be different from mechanical properties of region B. And at the same time, I mean, I mean region C, and at the same time, Region B, the interface is not strong enough. Then, if you look at it very well, another work that we're able to, um, that we did, we did a kind of a TM analysis also. We found out that densification here were not, I mean, not fully dense. Now, and if you want to increase the, what do you call it, the sinking time, you begin to form so many metacarbides. And you don't want um, more of it. And if the sinking time is lower, the, you observe that, I mean, there will not be, I mean, densification. Then possibly another issue that probably due to carryover problems during the mixing, because um, if the carbon nanotubes are not well mixed, a particular section will be purely carbon nanotubes. A particular session would purely met us. I don't know the I know the day. I mean this area is well center, this area is well center, here is not well center, see the interface, it's also no well center. That's the dilemma. Now we I mean I've talked about the area of um carbide formation. Then there is another problem in which we begin to find a reagglomeration of carbon nanotubes. The carbon nanotubes that you want to be well dispersed so that they can carry the load, you see that they begin to coagulate again. Then, I mean, however, we, we found a particular area, okay, good, good interface. Despite that, we still find a kind of a reagglomerated CNT. This poses a lot of issues. Okay, um, let me come back to um, the work that we did on um, carbon nanotubes with copper. We, I mean, the method that we use, we observe that the integrity of carbon nanotubes were retained. There was no damage. We, we used Raman, and it was perfectly okay. Then we tested for the um, coefficient of thermal, thermal expansion by adding 2% weight, I mean, I mean, volume percent of carbon nanotubes. We were able to drop down the thermal conductivity from 16.1 to 5.7. Now you notice that if you use this type of material in your cell phone, in your computers, your computer will not be hot. So it can work for a very long time and there will not be a kind of a thermal problem. With this, I mean, a few work, try to look at the mechanical property, the, the way the material deform. We found out that by the time we, by the time we added carbon nanotubes, you can see that um, the, I mean, it forms a, a kind of a net that pin down this location. I'm trying to rush because of time. Now, um, let me give 
a kind of a work that we did in the area of carbon nanotubes with titanium. By the time we added carbon nanotubes, by increasing carbon nanotubes, we found out that agglomeration of carbon nanotubes began to agglomerate. By the time we increase the speed, um, this one is one that has um, commercially better because to see a kind of a deformation of the carbon nanotubes. But we were able to observe that some of them were very, very perfect. And now we also studied the integrity of the material. We found out that by the time um, when we did um, our dispersion, there were some problems with the carbon nanotubes. They were damaged. But by the time we sintered it, we found that up to 2%, the integrity of carbon nanotubes were restored. Then, um, when we, now, okay, yes, yeah, so when we did the sintering, the integrity of carbon nanotubes were restored. Um, we studied the um, image analysis, trying to study some phase, phase analysis. We were able to observe that the, the technique that we use, and I mean, the dispersion technique that we use, the sinting technique that we use, we were able to observe that the integrity of common resources was very okay, the interplanar spacing quite okay. We were able to see very good interface, um, CNT, um, titanium, very good, very good interface. We did some other work, try to, try to understand here, um, this is the TIC for 1%, 2%. We observed that with 3% multiple carbon nanotubes, there are so many carbides that were formed. But with, um, with 2%, the amount of carbides that were formed were very, very low. So we now came out that, okay, but using 2% has been able to come up with material with improved property. We also study the, um, the tribological properties to see which of them can withstand degradation better. We observe that um, though with, um, I mean, normally by American standard, we, you just go between um, 10 and 15. By 15 Newton, we observe that the one with 2%, the weight, I mean, the degradation resistance was very high. We studied the breakage. We observed what, what the carbon nanotube to do. do. Carbon nanotube were able to form a kind of a net in there. So, I mean, as you are trying to pull, the carbon nanotube were not allowing allowing the materials to pull. So meaning that um, if this material is used, I mean, in service, even though, if, even if there's a fault, um, if there's a crack, the carbon nanotube will retain the crack. Uh, let me begin to wind up as I talk about a work that we did in the, in the area of bio um, tribal corrosion. We were trying to develop um, Titanium C4, um, we reinforce it with smart ceramic with possible application for a medical implant. This work is actually being done with my collaborators in, I mean, the two people I said, one in US, one in France. And so my students actually, I mean, um, in France now, continue the work. Um, generally, this is what we observe. We may not be able to explain, but let me just uh, explain to us. Um, if we have, this is the potential, this is time. The higher the potential, the more thermodynamic, stable the material is. The lower the potential, the lower, I mean, I mean the material become a bit unstable. So the material will be prone to degradation. So what we did was that we applied force for the first few 
few seconds, there was no force acting. Later, we applied force because we are trying to study, trying to simulate what, what happened within the joint system, where there is wear and there is corrosion. So we studied the material in um, a simulated environment. Now, if you look at it very well, we have three zones. Zone, zone three, zone one, zone two. Zone three is the area where the, where the material is only subjected to corrosion. There is no wear taking place. Zone one is where there is active wear, where there is friction taking place. Zone two is the area where um, the wear has taken place and the material is now exposed to corrosion again. If you look at it very well, materials that has 5% um, zirconia were thermodynamically stable within the system. Um, permit me to say that titanium C4 is one of the materials being used for medical implants, but they had um, they are prone to a lot of travel corrosion issues. That why is that? So when we go for, um, let's say, um, what, what call it, and um, bone replacement, before you know it, the person begin to have have some pains because of the problem of travel corrosion. Now, when we added sarconia up to five percent, the resistance to wear, to corrosion, and to the combined action of corrosion and wear was high. We now try to explain here. What happened? One, in zone one, okay, zone three, we're not, we're not considering zone three because the film, uh, I mean, was there. I mean, in zone one, zone one was when there was friction and it's peeling off the, I mean, passive film. Zone two is where, I mean, we wanted to see a material that does not um, probably that, that cannot come back again, that is not, that, that, that is not pseudopathic passive enough, remains as the one on top. Whereas a material that can passivate and is pseudoplastic in nature will try to, I mean, form, regenerate, just like our skin. I mean, I have a word that we are trying to do I mean, in the area of self-healing materials. So the material was able to heal itself. We did a kind of a team, um, same work. This is the one without sarconia. Okay, I think I'm okay. This is the one with 5%, this one with 10%. By 5%, we began to see that there was film, film formation, but not totally covering. By 10%, the film formation has totally covered it, and the material was well protected. General observation. From the work that we have done, from understanding the problem that material faces, we observe that um, choice of material system, okay, I'm talking about during non engineering material development, choice of material systems is critically important. Either if you want to use carbon nanotubes because of the properties, if you want to use smart ceramics, a ceramic that can repassivate. A ceramic material that can um, that has a kind of a pseudoplastic nature because when you add ceramics into your metals, it, I mean ceramic itself um, is hard. Then the materials can be able to repassivate and retain its shape. Then the choice of dispersion and consolidation techniques is very important. One homogeneity of um, of the reinforcing phase. It's very important. If it's not well homogenized, it will, uh, it will become a problem. The bonding and the interfacial reaction has to be well controlled, and the metallurgical interaction has to be fully understood. If this one is taken, we will be able to trade off and compromise on the overall engineering properties. Food for thought. The reality of life is that Environments are more complex than we think of. Ability to be able to make a right decision 
on the right materials and the appropriate processing technology is important. And if that one is taken into consideration, you'll be able to obtain a material that can make, that can make the right choices, uh, the right choice in service. A material that will be able to come back again, a, a material that can be able to carry the load and every other engineering properties. Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic, Professor Parekh, Executive Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and the Built Environment, Professor Sinha, Professor Olibambi, the man of the night. <laughs> Distinguished guests, academics, ladies and gentlemen, hopefully all protocol observed. Now, of course, I've got a few notes. I don't normally do notes. First of all, I'd like to thank Professor Olibambi and the University of Johannesburg for the honour and the privilege to come and be the respondent tonight. And I, I'm thoroughly enjoying this. It's a pleasure for me. It's a really huge pleasure. I've seen the growth of this academic from when he was finishing off his PhD to now he's a professor. And I've been in awe of the way he brings in money for equipment and how he plans and how he gets it. And I just wish I could work out how he does it. <laughs> but, you know, he is really, really good at, des at designing how he wants things to run and getting them. And I'm really in awe of that. I thoroughly enjoyed your address tonight. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed the dilemma, um, and I, I, I think the way that you took us through the materials and the dilemmas and the tensions that you have between trying to go for one property and not ending up with another property, I think that was excellent. Thank you very much. There's only one bit I didn't enjoy, and that was the bit that you had uh, the joint and you were talking about the bones and the wear, especially with more weight and I didn't enjoy that bit very much because I'm an, I'm an ex -long, long distance runner and I'm carrying more weight than I should be and I get a few aches and pains now and I thought no I, I didn't enjoy that so sorry <laughs> but I did enjoy nearly all of your address um, I enjoyed the development of your research and I always find it funny that somebody who is in hydrometallurgy ends up in corrosion because to me they're sort of equal and opposite of each other. And maybe one day when you get bored of tribal corrosion you might go back to hydrometallurgy. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it, it's a very nice progression and I thoroughly enjoyed the way that you, you showed how things fitted together, you showed the problems, you showed the way around it. And yes, that was marvellous because materials is a dilemma. Because we're fighting, and in the materials world, we're fighting against so many different things. We want certain properties. And we find often that to do something for the structure, and that, that was mentioned, that you need the fine structure for these good properties. To do something, you often get the property that you want, and then you miss out on another property. So the classic one is usually you increase the strength, and then it become, you lose some of the ductility and it becomes brittle. And that was covered very well tonight, that was great. The, the things with properties is you, you try your best to get the properties you want and most of the ones, we, I mean the ones that we saw here, they worked. Sometimes they don't. And it's great to see that the, the way that these things were, the samples were prepared, Obviously, the properties were obtained, and then they were analysed, they were characterised. That's great, because that's a real demonstration of what our discipline is about. So I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. And I thoroughly enjoyed the theme of the dilemma, because that's, that's what we're trying to do, and it is a dilemma. And it could be a whole, not, not just a talk, it could go on, it could be a course, it could be almost a degree, the di dilemma of materials. Because... Professor Olubambi didn't have time to go into all of it. Obviously, he couldn't. But there's the dilemma. He mentioned the cost, and he mentioned a little bit. But there's the dilemma of the cost. Sometimes we find a fantastic material, but the people don't want to buy it because it's too expensive. So we've got that dilemma, and you think, now, now what do we do? I love the example of the, um, the, 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 the Airbus 380. That is a classic example. Lightweight, lightweight, lightweight. 
and then oops it's not it's it's not wearing it's not managing quite as well as it should should be that was great i really like that so i think it was an excellent address i thoroughly enjoyed it apart from the bits with the joint <laughs> I think you covered the subject very well, and I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. It was an honour and a privilege. Thank you very much. And I'd just like to finish with a quotation by one of my favourite people. And one of the things we must remember is that it's very difficult. To, to make progress is very difficult, because sometimes you, you make the things that you think you're going to make and then the conditions change, okay? That has happened quite a lot. You develop an alloy for a certain niche and they move it and they use it somewhere else and oops, it, it didn't quite work there. So that's quite good because it shows, it gives us as materials people chance to think and rethink what we're doing, chance to develop, chance to do all those, all those good things and to do more research. And remember, to do more research, we need a nice environment to do it in, a nice university. We need good equipment, state-of-the-art equipment. We need students. We need good students. We need students who are going to throw their, their all into this. And that's what we need. And we're never, I don't think we're ever going to, there's always going to be something for research. And I'd just like to almost wind up. Um, sorry about these new glasses <laughs> right this is the quotation it is well in science that questions remain unanswered and probably unanswerable than, sorry that more questions remain unanswered and probably un unanswerable than are ever answered for this is the stuff of research isn't that lovely and that was Gordon Lindsay MacLean in 1990 and uh, he, he was an ornithologist and a very nice person. And one of my hobbies is bird watching. That's how I got to know him. Um, but I'd like to say thank you very much for the presentation, the address. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a very good overview of what you're doing, where you're being, why. I thoroughly enjoyed it, apart from the joints. And thank you very much for inviting me to do this. And thank you very much for the University of Johannesburg in letting me do this. Thank you. Professor Cornish, I also was very startled by the knee example. I think I'm going to be needing a knee replacement surgery very soon. And before I go for one, I'm coming to talk to you.